Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us. Um, also, thanks for bearing with us that little technical glitch there. You might have been kicked out for a second. Sorry about that. Um, so let's see, just for a brief introduction here, my name is Allison Leahy, and I'm the community manager at Ning. For those of you who aren't all that familiar with Ning, we are a company dedicated to the cultivation of online community. The Ning platform is a fully hosted self-service solution for building online community, and over 2 million communities have been launched on Ning over the past six years. We also just recently launched a completely redesigned version of the platform, which includes more publishing tools and design flexibility than ever before. So if you're interested in seeing the new Ning in action, I encourage you to visit ning.com. But we all know why you're here today, and I want to thank you for taking the time to join us. In just a few minutes, I'll turn it over to Patrick O'Keefe, who is going to give us the lowdown on how to monetize your online community. Before I do, though, I want to make sure you all know a bit about Patrick. Patrick has been managing online communities for over 13 years, so that's long before the term social media was coined. He is the founder of the iFroggy Network, a publisher of websites, and he has authored a few books on the subject. In fact, Managing Online Forums was the first book I really ever read on the discipline of community management, and it helped me to prepare for my role with Ning, but it also gave me a better understanding of social engagement in general. So I definitely recommend that one. And in addition to cultivating online communities, Patrick is responsible for creating quite a few, including karateforums.com, phpbhacks.com, and photoshopforums.com. He blogs about online community at managingcommunities.com and his favorite record label at badboyblog.com. So we're very lucky to have Patrick here today. Um, if you have any questions, and we hope you do, please submit them using the questions feature in GoToWebinar. We will field those and take some time at the end to answer as many as we can. And if you like what you hear today, we invite you to tweet with us using the hashtag NingTalk. So without further ado, here's Patrick O'Keefe. Hello, thank you for the introduction, Allison. Thank you for the kind words. I'm, I'm really glad to hear that uh, about the book. I love hearing stories like that. Uh, it means a lot. So let's see, today we're gonna talk about monetizing your online community. And um, you know, I call it an introduction. And, and what I mean is that I'm gonna, uh, we have uh, you know, a limited amount of time here. I can't keep you all day. so. Uh, there's a lot of methods that you can use to monetize your online community and I'm going to highlight the most meaningful ones and I'm going to give you some tips to get started and some tips to take it to the next level. My goal is to uh, give you a really strong good idea of what's out there so that you can decide what will work best for you and then go out and do further research and get things going uh, today if you want to. Um, now as I said if you have questions well, definitely I'll stay as long as I'm allowed to answer as many questions as possible so please uh, do uh, submit those. And when I talk about monetization, you know, I'm not talking about consulting services. I'm not talking about selling yourself, um, selling your soul, <laughs> as I do, um, but how to directly monetize an online community. And you know, monetization can mean different things to different people. I think, obviously, if you're running an online community as part of a business or for a business, certainly um, businesses need to generate revenue. So there's that obvious need, but also. You know, I think most online communities are started, and I think this is, uh, I don't know as far as the Ning platform is concerned, but I, I bet there's a substantial portion of Ning uh, platform owners who start their communities based on a hobby or a passion, and then it, it turns into something a lot more time commitment wise. You know, online communities take a lot of time to run. A lot of that stuff happens behind the scenes. Members don't ever know about it, but it still happens, and they become a part time job, even a full time job. And, you know, we have to support ourselves and our families, and when it comes down to it, when that community starts to eke its way into that time, um, you know, something has to go. And if, if the community isn't generating any income, if it's not supporting you in any way, then it can't be your full-time job. You have to cut away from the community, and, and so you can't spend the time you want on it. So monetization allows people who, uh, you know, who want to invest that time in their community to be able to do so while not, uh, you know, putting themselves or their family in the poorhouse. And of course, there's also people who just want to break even. They don't want to lose money on their community. It's not about turning it into a profession or spending all their time on it, but it still does cost money to host an online community. So hopefully I can help uh, you know, those three groups today. You know, monetization can allow you to turn something that you are passionate about into a profession. So uh, as Allison said, I'm Patrick O'Keefe. Um, 
you know, I wrote a couple of books, uh, managing online forums, monetizing online forums. I'm on Twitter and I froggy. I managing online communities for about 13 years. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm in the space. I, I, I firsthand manage communities myself. I don't just, I'm not just like a consultant or anything. I, I really do it. And I believe that's a part of uh, just staying grounded in this profession. Now I mentioned monetizing online forums and that's a free ebook that you can download uh, right now. No strings attached. It was in development for nine months. It's about a hundred pages. It is not a marketing gimmick like most free ebooks are. You will not be asked for your email address. You will not be asked to like anything. You will not be asked to do anything. You will just be provided with a direct link to the book. Um, and, uh, and, and they'll sort of help you as you find methods that you want to dive a little deeper into. Like when I talk about a method today, I can't talk about one method for an hour. So this will allow you to get a real deep dive into any particular method you're interested in. Also, just serve notice that uh, Skimlings did uh, sponsor that book and sponsor its release. And I'm going to mention them today, so obviously I'm affiliated with them. And just as a point of disclosure, I assume I'm affiliated with everyone because um, to be able to speak about these topics, I have experience with most of these methods or all of them, and I've worked with the companies I'm going to mention. I have a publisher relationship, like I'm a member of Ad Network. So I'm going to mention some Ad Networks that I've worked with. So just assume that I've, I've worked with these companies in some capacity. Now, when people when you talk about monetization, I think the, the first method people jump to is display advertising. And, you know, that's for good reason. Display advertising is a mature, very mature medium, and there's a ton of companies, a ton of vendors out there that want to help you get the most out of your display advertising inventory. So I'd like to talk about that method first and foremost. Now, with display advertising, um, I want to hit a, a kind of a few general questions people have. First of all, the revenue models. You have really four revenue models that exist. First is sponsorship. That is when someone pays you a flat rate for time. They're buying out this spot. They're sponsoring this spot. They're not paying to share it with anyone else. They're buying it out. CPM is cost per 1,000 impressions. That's not buying out a spot. That's paying for a certain amount of appearances in that spot. CPA is cost per action. That's when people pay you when a visitor takes an action. They buy a product. They give them their contact information, etc. CPC is cost per click. Now, there's a lot of ad sizes out there. So what ad sizes should you use? Well, the IAB, the Internet Advertising Bureau, publishes the Display Advertising Creative Format Guidelines. And if you Google search that, Display Advertising Creative Format Guidelines, you'll find that document. And it, that'll show you the standardized sizes for display advertising. In general, you want to stick to those sizes. But of the many standard sizes that are out there, three in particular tend to be the most popular. 728 by 90, 300 by 250, and 160 by 600. And those are pixels. Um, those That's width by height. And, you know, if you join any ad network or get into serving ads, you'll quickly find that those sizes tend to be the most popular, the most highly recommended. How many ads should you have on a page? Now, this will differ certainly by the amount of screen real estate you have and the demand that you have. But for most people, three to four ads per page tend to be a pretty good guideline. I think sometimes people believe that more uh, ads mean more revenue, and that is absolutely not the case. More ads oftentimes can mean less money because it dilutes the value of the other ads. If you think of a page that has two ads on it, and both of those ads are in high demand, if they have people who want to buy those ads, and then you add two more to the page, and there's not the demand. It doesn't exist for those ads. No one wants to buy them. They, they are making just a little, bit of, a, a little bit of money. So what happens is you've now taken the attention off of the two ads that were there already, and now it's spread to the four ads. So there's less attention being paid. And so those two ads on top that were sold out now are less valuable. So you've diluted the value of that advertising possibly hurt your opportunity to generate revenue um, simply by adding more ads to the page. And of course, let's not forget more ads to the page. It's, it's about balance. You want to find the right balance between page content and, and ads on the page and ensure a great positive user experience. And that is vital uh, with online communities. Um, it, you know, and that's what I'm going to talk about today numerous times. It's all about the balance between um, you know, finding that comfortable balance where people will enjoy using your website. So if you have an experience with ads that is negative, that drives down your traffic, which also directly impacts the amount of money that you can make from display advertising. So, um, you know, in short, more ads doesn't mean more money. You want to ensure that the, that the demand exists for those ads. Ad placement, you know, as much as I would like to tell people that you can hide the ad and it will perform, <laughs> that's just not the case. 
Um, the bottom line is that closer to content performs better. The closer an ad is to content, the closer it is to you know what people are doing on your website, the better it will perform, the more valuable it will be to advertisers. Because let's not forget, it's a balance of value here. Um, you have to provide value to your members. You have to provide value to your advertisers and to yourself. So you have to balance that out. Advertisers don't really give you money to give them nothing. So uh, you know you don't want to overload your page with ads. You want to be very careful. It's something I agonize over myself. Uh, whenever I'm trying to add an advertisement, but you have to find that balance and it's better to have, you know, a couple ads that are close to content than 10 ads that are spread at the bottom. Um, you may as well have, you know, no ads at all. Now to get started with display advertising, uh, ad networks are really the, you know, most, probably the best way to go because ad networks are companies that work with a lot of advertisers to sell ads and then distribute them to many different websites. So you personally, you may not have the size, the reach, the audience to sell an ad to Coca-Cola or to, um, you know, a major or Microsoft or a major company. But these ad networks, they have such a high level of scale working with websites and communities and publishers such as yourself that they can aggregate all that traffic into different channels. So Microsoft would come to them and say, we want to serve an ad on this particular type of website. And if your website matches that type, then you'll be a part of that ad sale and you'll get paid for the ads that you serve. Now the top three, um, and I should also say that, you know, they handle a, a lot of different kind of um, logistics of the relationship, serving the ads, dealing with the advertisers, taking the payments, etc. Now, with the top three uh, rows on this slide, these are all mainstream general advertising networks. They'll work with a lot of different kinds of sites. As long as your site meets their guidelines and their requirements and it's not pornography or you're doing something illegal, chances are that they will be able to serve that particular topic. The bottom two rows are different. Now, Cox Digital Solutions is a platform that niche ad networks use to run their uh, organizations. So a niche ad network, th those are the bottom three here. Th those are just a couple of examples of many that are out there. IDG Tech Network is focused at technology sites. Gourmet Ads is for food, food and wine sites. Trevora Media focuses at travel content. And Buy Sell Ads is not so much an ad, mar uh, an ad network as it is an ad marketplace. And I just want you to be aware of sites where, uh, like Buy Sell Ads, where you can uh, list your website, join their marketplace, and then sell ads through them to people who are looking on their uh, platform to buy advertising or to even people that you want to sell advertising to directly because they also handle uh, you know a lot of the headache, a lot of the logistics of that situation, um, like serving statistics to advertisers, like handling the payments, like dealing with support, etc. So that's kind of another component to this whole puzzle. And that kind of brings us to how to take it to the next level, and that's with direct selling. Ad networks are great, ad networks serve a purpose, but the reality is that, that if you're just using ad networks, you're most likely, or you're almost certainly not uh, coming close to maximizing the potential of your display advertising revenue. And when you're gonna sell direct, that means you have to serve ads. And so, you know, that might mean an ad server like DoubleClick for Publishers or OpenX. It might mean uh, Buy Sell Ads, which can act as an ad server, or Buy Sell Ads Pro, which is something they're working on. Uh, there's also ad optimization platforms like Pubmatic, Rubicon Project, AdMill that work to serve the best, um, highest paying ad for a particular page view. But you have to have an ad server of some kind. Now, when you go to sell, uh, you know, probably one of the first questions people ask is, how should I set my pricing? What, what should I charge people? And there's kind of two main ways I recommend you look at that. First, look at an ad marketplace like buysellads.com. And the great, the beauty of that marketplace is not only that they help you sell, but that they show you who else is selling, what they're selling, and for how much. So you can view a similar site, a site in your niche, and you can see, okay, this is what they're offering, and this is what they're charging. And perhaps most importantly, you can see if they're actually selling at that price. So that'll give you a good idea of what the market will bear. Also, look at what you're making with your ad networks already. Uh, like Google AdSense or like another ad network, because if you're making a certain amount to put in the effort, the extra work to direct sell, you have to charge a premium on top of that. So if you're making 50 cents CPM, 50 cents per 1,000 impressions, or a dollar CPM, let's say, with your ad networks, well, if you're gonna put in the extra effort to sell direct and to reach out to advertisers, then you need to charge um, you know, well in advance of that. You know, Depending on your traffic, that might be $2 CPM, three, four CPM. You, know, you can test the water, but the point is you wanna charge above whatever you're getting from ad networks to justify the extra time that you're gonna invest. When you're reaching out to advertisers, they need to know something about you. So you want some form of media kit. Now a media kit is a document that basically explains why you are attractive. 
you know, it might include details on your ad placements, how much traffic you receive, demographic information about your audience, and in general, just reasons that you are great. So accolades, if you have received any awards, if you've been featured in any noteworthy publications, if you have a lot of Twitter followers, Facebook fans, RSS subscribers, email subscribers, even if they're not advertising on your Twitter feed, just the, the fact that you have this mature built up community or this audience that exists, uh, speaks to your value and speaks to uh, the fact that you might be a party worth uh, working with. So how do you find advertisers to send that information to? I think it starts with identifying the people who are actually spending money. And the way that you can do that is to look at similar sites, look at other sites and see who's advertising on those sites. Also, you can use Google, uh, just search for a term related to your website. I run a martial arts community, so I might enter martial arts or martial arts store or martial arts goods and see who's advertising on Google, see who's actually spending ad money, because if they're spending ad money uh, in that way, then they might also want to spend ad money with me to reach the same audience and then make it easy for people to buy. You know, Using something like buysellads.com or an, uh, an ad server where people can simply visit a website, upload a creative, place an order. Um, I think that helps people to, it helps you to take advantage of the impulse buy, people wanting to buy at this moment and not wanting to, and not finding someone else because they had to wait to contact you or to speak with you. And buysellads.com is an easy way to do that. Just to close out display advertising, I mean, the key to maximizing display advertising is to use a blended approach. So what I mean by that is you have different tiers of your display advertising. You know, your top tier, your, your best paying ads, right? Those are the ones you sell direct yourself. Those are your premium ads when you have a direct relationship with the advertiser. That's how you get the most money. But you won't, always, you won't always be able to sell out on those ads. Most everyone isn't. Pretty much no one sells out their ads uh, direct. So then what, what can you do? Well, that's where ad networks come in. And as you use ad networks, then you'll identify some of the ad networks that pay you better than others. Those will be your premium ad networks. So if you can't sell direct, then you'll send that traffic to them. And then they'll run into ads and they'll have to serve what's called a default ad. And you want to monetize those. So you'll send that traffic to your lower tier ad networks, the ones that perform uh, less, that don't perform as well. So they might not be paying you all that much. Maybe it's 10 cents CPM, maybe it's 20 cents CPM, whatever it is. It may not be a lot for what you generally receive but it's better than zero. So then they'll run that ads. So then where do you go? Well, you can do uh, affiliate ads where people pay for actions or people pay for uh, people buying a product. You can advertise internal features on your website, like a new feature or, or some sort of functionality on your website, a photo gallery, whatever, uh, just to make sure you're getting value out of that placement. So you know, by using those four different tiers, you ensure that even if you can't do the top one or the top two, you still are getting value out of those placements. Because if you run out uh, of any of those and you don't have anything behind them, you don't have this blended approach, and you'll just make zero off of the placements. And that's um, obviously not the goal here. All right, so next method I want to talk about is affiliate programs and CPA networks. CPA stands for cost per action. Now that's when you know someone is paying you because a visitor, because someone on your website clicked and they bought a product or they signed up for a list or they requested more information. Basically they took some sort of action. It's more than a click, it's, it's some sort of actual action after the click. Now there are a lot of affiliate programs out there and if you've never spent much time looking at affiliate programs, you might be surprised by the quantity of programs that exist in the world. No matter what your, you know, whatever, no matter what your community is about, no matter the topic you cover, there is a very, very good chance that people who want to sell to that audience um, have an affiliate program. Uh, that, you know, and and you don't really know it until you go looking. So here's a, a very small number of affiliate programs on this page. Amazon and eBay tend to be, uh, you know, popular ones because they sell a lot of different products. They sell things that can meet with pretty much any audience and they have that massive base of products. So, you know, those are very popular, maybe the two biggest independent affiliate programs in the world. But, you know, it's not, it's more than just retail. I think, you know, when people think affiliate programs, they think sales, retail, online shopping, but there's a lot of different programs that serve a lot of different uh, niches. So for example, Ford will pay you for people who want to buy a car or inquire about buying a car. Rev Response will pay you to host a uh, directory of free trade publications, which they'll pay you for downloads of those publications. TurboTax will pay you for people who want to do their taxes, which is timely for part of the year we're in right now, at least in the US. 
Simply Hired uh, will pay will pay you for uh, job listings. They'll create a job board with you, split the revenue, and also if you don't have any listings, they'll backfill your job board with results from their network, and you'll get paid per click on the jobs that your visitors click on. American Express will pay you for people who want to uh, you know get a credit card. I mean, the key here is really to find the right programs, and you know some of the generic programs might work as well, but Oftentimes, when you want to find those niche programs, those smaller programs, you need to look into the affiliate networks. Um, you know, direct programs tend to be uh, somewhat rare. I mean, the, Amazon is a direct and independent program. They run their own program. Most programs tend to be a part of an affiliate network like Google Affiliate Network or Commission Junction or LinkShare. Basically, these are platforms that allow people to sign up and create their own affiliate program with, uh, you know, relative ease rather than having to host their own program and getting into all of the logistics of that. So these are kind of turnkey platforms, and because of that, there are a lot of affiliate programs that fall under the affiliate networks. So when you join one, what you'll do is you'll apply your websites, and they'll get approved, and then you'll be able to apply for each program one by one and then get approved for entry into that program and then manage all those relationships within just that uh, network or through a single console. With affiliate uh, and CPA, you know, disclosure is a big deal. And, um, you know, that, that's something you can read up on. That's a topic in and of itself. But the main thing about disclosure uh, when it comes to affiliate links is that you always need to disclose if the person offering an opinion stands to benefit from offering that opinion. Now, what does that mean? So if you're the CEO of the company, you benefit from the sale. So yeah, you need to disclose you're the CEO or being your own product. Hopefully you never would if you're the CEO. Now, you know, but in addition to that, if you've received a free book, you got to disclose that. If you link with affiliate links in your review or where you say, hey, I like this product a lot, you guys should check it out. It doesn't have to be like a full analytical review, just some sort of nod uh, of support. You know, you guys should look at this. If you're using an affiliate link, you need to disclose that you're using an affiliate link. Not on some small text in the footer that's hidden, not in some side page that's linked from the footer, but in the actual work itself, in the post, in the article. It has to live with the work. So just use that as a general good standard. Um, and anything else, you know, you have to look into further or do your, or your own research, but that tends to be a very good guideline to follow. And if you do so, you'll probably be okay. Um, obviously not a lawyer, so all the standard disclosures apply. Now, getting started with affiliate and CPA, when you join a program, you're going to see they have tools available to you. So that's how you get started. Use those tools. It could just be a simple text link, which obviously is not much of a tool or a graphic ad, but depending on the program, some have, uh, you know, more elaborate tools like Amazon, for example, they will allow you to create a ad that is a playable widget for an album uh, that they sell in their MP3. So if you were talking about an album or reviewing an album, you can embed this player. People could listen to snippets right from your website without leaving your website, and then they could buy the MP3 of a song or the album. Amazon offer, offers an auto parts finder widget. Um, eBay offers you the ability to uh, create uh, this display ad sized um, areas where you can list products uh, that are related to your niche. So you could enter, again, I just did this on my martial arts community, actually. So I created a banner that displays products that have the keywords of martial arts and karate and taekwondo, etc. And so, you know, to a, to a visitor to my website, that's actually really interesting because they love the martial arts and they are interested in martial arts, goods, and memorabilia. So when they see that, that's, a, that's something that will be directly relevant to them and something that could add value for them. And then I get a percentage of the sale generated when clicked on, when people click on that banner. So again, that's that's a default tool, and I used it and, and have you know have made a little bit with it already. Now to take it to the next level, I think you want to take a look at skim links. And if you're not familiar with skim links, what they do is so by default on your community, people talk about products most likely. People talk about products all the time, and they link to uh, online stores and places where their product can be purchased. But Online communities don't really get credit for the role they play in purchase intent. Online communities play a major role in purchase intent. When people want to look up information about a product, when they want to see what people say about that product, what they think, the problems they've had, uh, you know, they'll very commonly end up in a forum. And they might click off from that forum and buy the product, but the forum never receives credit for that. The community owner never receives credit for that. Skinlinks more or less helps you, ensures that you get that credit. What they do is they can take links posted on your website that are already there that you or members post, uh, not links that are added, you know, just links that are already there, and then ensure you get credit for the sales generated through those links. Uh, the links don't change. They don't go to a different website. There's no redirecting page. It doesn't work in any, uh, it works as it should. It works in a very good uh, way. Nothing changes. Nothing is different about the experience. You just get credit for the sales. They have, they have an additional feature where um, 
they can identify product mentions and text content and then link those product mentions to uh, stores where they can be purchased or to a price comparison so that people can find the cheapest price. But that's optional. Uh, for a lot of people, you'll just want to leave it on the default setting of just the links that are already there, making sure you get credit for those links. So it's, it's very useful. It's very powerful. Uh, like I said, it works as it should. And then the other thing about taking it to the next level is to work with APIs, application programming interfaces. And to sum it up, some of these stores, Amazon, eBay, they'll allow you to slice and dice their product data, right? As long as it's in line with their program policies and it is in line, uh, you know, yeah, basically that's it. With those policies, you're limited only by your imagination and your programming ability or the ability to hire a programmer. So, you know, you can take product images, product descriptions, reviews, prices, all the product content from Amazon, and you can use that product content, totally okay, totally legal, they want you to use it, um, in any way that you can see fit as long as it meets their program guidelines. So, you know, you, you really, like I said, limited only by your imagination. So if you have a great idea for how you can use that product data from Amazon or from eBay or from some other um, uh, affiliate program that offers an API, you know, that's something definitely to check out if you have a great idea. Now, I talked about skim links, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, in-text monetization. As it sounds, monetizing text content on your community. So there's two types of in-text monetization. There's in-text advertising, there's in-text affiliate links. With advertising, it is, you know, a, a vendor is going to identify content, text content that matches with ad campaigns and then link that text to ad campaigns and you'll get paid most likely per click. Sometimes, uh, you know, massing over the link will lead to an ad being displayed of some kind. So you might get some CPM, but a lot of it tends to be cost per click. And then affiliate works kind of as I just explained as far as skin links goes. Um, affiliate ties in the links that are already posted on your website. So a member, uh, members are having this, a discussion about a product, they link to Amazon. Um, by default, all the sales generated from that link on your community, you don't receive any credit for. Skin links will make sure you get credit for those links without changing the experience or changing the link um, at all. They also offer a feature, like I discussed, where they can identify product mentions in text content, but that is an optional uh, option. That's an optional option. That's a good one. That is a choice uh, that you can use that you don't have to use it. And certainly many communities want to leave that off. Within text monetization, you want to get started using uh, vendors. I mean, that tends to be the, the only way to go about it. You don't really run your own in-text platform. You don't really host your own in-text platform. Um, there's kind of three main vendors out there for the in-text advertising, Vibrant Media, Kintera, InfoLinks. For affiliate, for affiliate links, I recommend skim links. Disclosure is vital within text, especially with uh, affiliate uh, disclosure. And these, these companies will tell you how to disclose. Like they, I don't recommend these companies because they are uh, devious or unethical. They'll tell you how to disclose. And then skim links will tell you that some of the most popular integrations that you've had with online communities are when the community owner or manager simply um, comes out and says, hey, we're using this. That's what this is. Um, we're going to use this. We're going to get credit for the sales generated through our website. And they're totally upfront about it and honest. And the community responds well uh, to, to just being told. Now, do you have to, does everyone need to go that far? Do you really need to do that? It depends on your audience, probably. Um, what, I just, what I discussed earlier about benefiting from the affiliate links in a review that you wrote, that still applies here. If you have skin links and you write a review or you recommend a product and you link and you're going to get credit for that link and you're going to get uh, you know, a portion of the purchase, that has to be disclosed. Uh, you have to do that. So not only for the FTC's sake, but just for your own ethics, you have to disclose that. So beyond that, if you want to go uh, above and beyond that, again, Skimlinks ha has had a lot of success with people who simply tell their communities, hey, we're going to try this. And it's, it's a good thing because it's not adding additional advertising to the website. It's not adding anything to the website at all. There's not more display ads on the page. You're not taking up more of the screen real estate. You're simply taking the links that are already there and getting a little bit of credit for the sales generated through them. To take it to the next level within text, you want to look at product-centric forums and product-centric sections of your website, sections that encourage uh, product-related discussions that your members want to have. You know, um, there's, a, there's plenty of examples of this, but one thing that I've seen some communities do is they create like an eBay form or an eBay-focused form or section where people can post links to cool eBay auctions they notice or recommend their own auctions. So, you know, these are something that the visitors want to see because people – People choose to view this classified ad sections of the newspaper. People choose to go to eBay and they choose to go to Craigslist to look for things in specific categories. The same is true for your members of your community. Um, if there is a targeted section that shares cool items related to the niche of your community, they'll want to see that, they'll want to share that. And having a section that encourages that also encourages them to post links 
which then can be monetized through an in-text monetization vendor. And then you can get credit for any sales generated through them. Of course, you can also have things like review sections and other product-centric areas that are related to your niche. I also want you to think about tailored integration because, and this is with anything I talk, talk about today, with the other methods I discuss as well, just because you want to use something, uh, that doesn't mean that uh, everyone has to see it, right? So, for example, just because I want to display an ad doesn't mean it has to be displayed to every single visitor. I could display it just to visitors who are logged out, just to visitors who come from search engines, which are visitors that are known to click more ads. I could display it on just content older than two weeks. You know, you can do a lot of different ways. You, you can segment your audience in different ways so that, you know, maybe you don't want to show this ad to your most active members, your most active visitors. You know, it's up to you. The point is, it's not an all or nothing game here. You can display certain ads, certain methods to certain people that, and the people that it will resonate with most. So I talked a little bit about classified ads, and I want to dive into that because I think it's a really powerful thing that uh, you know only only a very small number of communities have taken advantage of. So classified micro ads. I mean, if you want to hire someone or you want to sell some used gear, right? You aren't going to buy a display ad on someone's website. You're not going to buy a banner to sell your used bicycle. It doesn't make any sense. But if you could go to uh, you know a community or an area where the audience at that site or that community is, is focused to the people who would want what you have to offer. You would definitely buy a classified ad or a small ad in a section dedicated where you know people are looking. And you know, there's a lot of opportunities for people who would like to advertise but don't want to or don't need to buy a display ad. They don't need that kind of big mainstream message. They're not interested in that. They're interested in it ha having a specific thing. They're interested in hiring someone in selling something specific. So it's really about thinking small, and I want to give you a couple of examples of this that, that, have, uh, that I think are really good. So I don't know who's familiar with 99designs and Flippa, but 99designs is leader in crowdsourced web design. Flippa is the largest uh, marketplace for buying and selling websites. Now, these are two big companies. They've got dedicated staffs. They have multi-million dollar revenue, a um, ton of traffic. You can view them and see the number of listings. These are, these are legitimate companies. What a lot of people don't know about these companies, though, is that they started as individual forums in the SidePoint forums, at SidePoint.com slash forums. And the reason I know that is because I was a staff member at the time. Uh, you know, I joined that community, I think, when there was like 70,000 posts. I joined the staff, 100 and something thousand, 120,000. It's now almost at 4 million. And at the time, Matt Miskovich of SidePoint will tell you that they added that section, those, those forums, for buying and selling websites and, and for design contests because people wanted to do it. And it aided in moderation because we had to keep removing it. This gave them a place to put it. Now, you know, they charged a little bit just to cut down on the noise somewhat, $5 a thread, whatever it was. And people took to it. And they used it. And they posted a lot of ads in it. And then, you know, SidePoint did a little more with it. They made it bigger. They gave it its own section. Um, they offered people upgrades on their listings to get more attention. They raised the prices. And they continued to grow. They continued to be successful. And eventually they spun them off into 99designs and Flippa, which are these massively successful uh, companies. And if you look at the listings on these websites and you look at how much it costs per listing, you can do the math in your head and figure out that there's a lot of money being made here. You know, it may not be $500 at a time. It may be $25 at a time. But $25 time by $10,000, um, you know, it adds up. Right, so I think that's something that is sometimes overlooked. You want to look at display ads only. You want to look at these ads that cost a certain amount of money. There can be an opportunity missed in the smaller, more micro and uh, niche ads. The great thing about these sections is that it, it, they are ads, and people want to see them. People choose to see them. Like I said, people go to eBay. They go to Craigslist for this specific reason. They open up the newspaper for this specific reason. There should be a clear understanding that it's an advertisement. The idea here, if you do it like uh, you know other types of content on your form, it should be clear, or your community, it should be clear that this is ad content people pay for. That's a good thing. There's nothing to hide. There's nothing to be, um, you know, there's nothing to try to hide. It's something that you should be upfront and honest about because that's what they want. That's why they're coming there. To get started with a classified ad uh, section or a micro ad section, just start a small section on your website or an individual form or an individual section of your community and charge for listings if you want. Or you could start it off as free, but it can be hard to go from free to pay. So you may just want to start with something small and see if people take to it. And if they do, then you can take it to the next level with premium upgrades and more attention. So 
you know, site point charged for threads, but I think where they really started to unlock it uh, in, in bigger ways was when they started charging for bringing more attention to your listing, you know, changing the listing color, making it bold, featuring it on the homepage, those sorts of things, the extra bells and whistles that people can pay for if they really want to. Just like you can pay in the newspaper to have more lines in your classified ad, right? Or you can probably pay to have text displayed in a certain way. The same thing is true online, and you can offer that as a, a feature. And, you know, there can be communities out there that I think can support themselves very, very well just based on classified ads, but they just don't try it. They just don't think to try it. They don't even need to have other forms of maybe more intrusive, uh, more, uh, yeah, intrusive advertising. And so, if you have the right audience, and I think a lot of people do, this is something that's definitely worth experimenting with. I want to talk briefly about sponsored brand placement, and what this means is it's kind of it's way more than kind of standard display advertising. Certainly, there's such things as sponsored sections, sponsored coverage, you know, coverage at an event or a conference presented by a brand, or brand specific forums or sections of your community. Um, you know, there's other things that you can do like sponsored or business memberships. And we're going to talk about premium memberships in a second, but you know, think of that concept applied to just business memberships. What 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 benefits can you offer businesses to be uh, and to have a recognized presence in your community, a recognized legitimate presence that you know they are a part of the community, they support the community. What benefits can you offer them? And you know, I can think of some, and I can think of plenty of examples. Uh, different kind of profile extras, more private message space, more signature space, special badges, special recognition within the community that to brands might be valuable because if if the members of your community see that this brand is supporting the community, then certainly that uh, uh, is a business advantage, right? I think business is personal, and we all do business with people we like, and we like the people who support the things we enjoy. Also, you know, things like advertisements on your community. Uh, recognition in a special section where you show sponsoring, uh, sponsored or official business memberships, deeper analytics within your community. Web Hosting Talk has a program where hosting companies can pay for a professional membership and they get access to uh, monitoring services within the community that notify them when their brand is mentioned. So things like that, business value, business benefits. What can you offer businesses to have them pay for an account? There's also such a thing as product review programs, focus groups, and panels. Brands who want to get information from your uh, community. They want to have them influence their products or help them to do business in a better way. And, uh, you know, one example of this is, is the student room, the studentroom.co.uk. And if you Google search the student room rate card in Media Pack or just Media Pack, the student room, whatever, some combination of that, you'll find their Media Pack and it explains the programs they run. And they run these types of programs product reviews, focus groups, panels. You know, it's not something that it happens a, a lot, I will say, but if you have the audience, this is something that, that can occur and you can work with brands. To get started, if you're interested in starting a program like this, I would contact familiar, friendly brands, brands that are already familiar with your community that you might have some relationship with, uh, maybe brands that your community likes, you know, brands that your community members talk about and appreciate, because then you can say, hey, look at this on my community. These people, they love your product and we were wondering if you would like to, you know, uh, have a deeper presence on our community. Now to go deeper, I, I think you can you know can create programs for brands to participate in your community through disclosed sponsored accounts because you know brands are criticized sometimes for uh, poor uh, poor outreach in online communities and I've criticized them myself. I've, I've outed companies before. Um, if you search for Sports Legends Challenge, you'll find maybe one of the more visible ones I outed. A network of people who are basically spanning online communities and you know I think that's good I think it's good that people know that you know we're watching that we won't just you know we won't know that they're doing it but plenty of brands want to do it right and plenty of brands want to participate in your community but they just might not know how so I think these programs can help them and if, if you want to just get started with one like I said reach out to a familiar friendly brand and see if they'll pilot it with you maybe give them a discount or let them do it for free just so you can work out the kinks and then you'll have that case study, hopefully a great case study where you can say, well, this is this brand participated and this is the benefit they got. And then you can use that case study to bring additional brands into the community. Next up is product sales. And, you know, when you say product sales, I think a lot of people will leap to merchandise sales, logoed merchandise. And that's, that's fine. I mean, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. That's a good product to sell. But I want you to think about products that would benefit your audience. I don't know your audience, only you know your audience and you know the stuff that they will be interested in. So what can you sell them that will help them do whatever they do better? Like scuba, scuba accessories. What, what can you sell them to help them uh, have more fun when they're 
doing when they're school buying or you know when they have this hobby if like you have a knitting community what knitting things what what things can you sell them to help them knit better and you know if you're a professional community or an educational community you can think about things like digital products books ebooks video education quality products things that your audience will be interested in and you know, I could I could pull on SitePoint again here as another example because they have taken a business that started as really a web development community and an online publication focused at web developers, and they've launched a successful book publishing business that's distributed in the U.S. by O'Reilly Media, and distributed around the world certainly. They've started Learnable, which is an online education community. They obviously started 99 Designs and Flippa. So. Though, if you go to the SiteFoin forums, you may not see tons of monetization on the forum. You can look in the header and you can appreciate the directions that they decided to take it, which is different than display advertising. You don't need display advertising. Certainly, they sell some, but they took it in a lot of different directions and offered a lot of interesting quality products. People use them, people pay for them, and they generate a lot of revenue that way. That said, let's talk about branded merchandise because it is so popular. So. I think a lot of branded merchandise out there tends to be just logos, and that's good. I think logo merchandise is good. People want to show that support for the community. But at the same time, think about things and making things that you'd actually want to use and wear. Um, you know, not to say I wouldn't wear a, a shirt with someone's logo on it, but I'd much rather wear something that looked, um, for lack of a better word, cool. So you know, think about things that make your community unique, catchphrases within your community, have it professionally designed. You know, make shirts that you'd want to wear. To get started, you can work with a print-on-demand company, certainly, like a Cafe Press or a Spreadshirt or a Zazzle. Uh, that's where most people start because there's no risk. They assume all the risk. They don't, you don't have to pay anything to set up to get started. They'll print it on demand, ship it out for you, and as part of that, they have a certain base price. And all that you can make in profit is what you mark up on. So these base prices can be you know, fairly high for t-shirts, let's say. And so I want to give you an example of kind of taking it to the next level with uh, print run or your own print run with a local print shop. So on Cafe Press, you may have sold 50 shirts for $29.95. Okay. Now, at that price, you probably made $7 a shirt because Cafe Press's base on those shirts is $22.95. So you marked it up seven bucks, you made seven dollars per shirt. That means 50 shirts, you made $350. Now, you could order 50 shirts to sell at $24.95 direct at the base cost of seven dollars each from a printer. And you would need to sell just 20 shirts to cover your base cost of $350, your, your risk. If you sold all 50 shirts, you would have $540 in profit before merchant or store costs. So that's more profit, and you were able to charge a more reasonable price for the shirts, which means more shirts will be sold. The more that you sell, the more that profit will scale. So I, I think you want to look at that, especially if there is some interest or demand in merchandise and you're having some success selling with the uh, print-on-demand companies, start taking a look at doing your own print runs and maximizing that revenue. Now I'd like to talk about uh, premium memberships and subscriptions. And this is when someone is paying for membership on your community. And it, it might not, in most cases, it's not simply to access the community. There are free accounts, but it is paying for extras or paying to support the community, giving benefits for doing so. And these programs, they aren't about taking things away from the free members. I think that's something that you want to be very uh, specific on and, and avoid very directly is, you know, a lot of communities get popular based on free members and they add premium memberships, but you never want to take anything away from the free members. It's about adding more to the premium members, not taking away from what has already existed for the free members. You, that you don't want to alienate people. When it comes to benefits, what can you offer? So private areas, exclusivity. Um, what can you offer people as far as exclusive content, exclusive access to experts or to other people? What kind of benefit can you give them that they don't get elsewhere? Also, there's things like greater profile options. Certainly more signature space, more private message space, bigger avatars, all that stuff. You know, the, the, the limitations that you have in your community, extending those limits a little bit for premium members. You can offer them discounts, coupons, increase freedom in areas otherwise limited. So if you are a professional community and you have an advertising forum or a review forum and you limit that to one per 30 days, maybe premium members can post twice or three times per 30 days. And another thing that tends to be popular is the ability to limit or turn off advertising on your community. So they're paying for you know, an ad-free experience. Pricing of these programs tends to be in the $3 to $10 range by and large. And you know that may not seem like a lot of money, but if you have you know 50 people paying $10 a month, 
it adds up. I mean, that's $500 a month and 6,000 a year. That can help you. If you're a professional community, if you are providing a service or providing a community or content that people actually take and make money from, right, a business community, then in those cases, if they're generating revenue from participating in your community, people tend to be more open to paying more. That's something to keep in mind as well. If, if, if your content is making them money, then they'll pay more. And of course, there's exceptions to this. Just in general, these programs tend to be in the 3 to $10 range. And to get started, I mean, offer a basic one-tier program. See if people are interested. See if people are signing up for it. And if it, if, it, if it grows and you can do more with it, then to take it to the next level, you can make it more robust, offer more benefits, offer more tiers, offer more options for people, even possibly take a look at starting your own private member community just for private members. I think the key to this for a lot of communities is minimizing the disconnect between premium and non-premium members. So just because you pay money or you suppose you pay me money, and I don't do any premium memberships right now, but I've thought about it and I am thinking about it. But just because you pay me money doesn't mean that you can do things as far as how you treat people, disrespectful comments, inflammatory comments. It doesn't mean that you can do that any differently than you would be allowed to if you were uh, not paying. You have to still treat people respectfully. You can't say things that are inflammatory, et cetera. Our standards as far as how one treats another, they don't change based on what you pay. I will ban you and refund your payment, and I won't think twice about it. It's, it's not you have to maintain that line of consistency because you don't ever want people to have good reason to question uh, your integrity or your fairness when it comes to dealing with uh, premium members versus non-premium. So always be very clear about that. Let's talk about mobile a little bit. And when you're monetizing for mobile, you're gonna talk about kind of three things. You're, you're monetizing access and applications monetizing with advertising, advertising companies and advertising sales directed specifically at mobile traffic. And you're talking about affiliate. Now affiliate uh, tends not to be terribly far along with mobile. A lot of affiliate programs do not accept mobile transactions, but I'm told that is getting better and some programs do. Now what's this chart? This chart is US smartphone owners from July 2007 through May 2012. And certainly you can see that it is going up. I cannot find a more recent version of this graph, I wish I could, I don't think they've released it, or if they have, I, I have not yet been able to find it. Now to get started with mobile, it's pretty basic, I think. You just wanna make sure you have a good mobile experience in place because a lot of people don't. So you need to have a mobile experience in place that can be monetized. To take it to the next level, it, that means working with mobile specific monetization vendors. The first three rows on this slide are all mobile ad networks. These are companies that sell specifically to mobile traffic. Smato is an optimization platform. They try to get to you the best paying advertisement for any particular mobile visitor. And Skimlinks also does some work with mobile with the affiliate programs that accept it. So if the program accepts it and someone links to it, then you can get credit for the sales that way. When it comes to apps, I think for the most part, selling for access, selling access to your community through an app tends not to be popular. It tends not to be a good thing. So what I recommend people look at if they want to go the app route is to look at offering a full featured app that offers value to your members, that solves a need for them, that solves a problem, that has these great features. Forget the access to your community. Is this an app that would stand on its own, that you could charge for on its own, on the value that it offers to uh, people like your visitors? If that's true, then you have something uh, that might be valuable and it might be able to generate a lot of revenue because it's simply useful. And then you could just throw access to your community on top of that not paying for the access, paying for this great app that solves a need, that makes them more productive, that helps them have more fun, that helps them document their hobby or their passion or their business or whatever. You have that great app they pay for anyway, and then access is a part of the community, and that'll help bring people to the community as well because people will buy the app for the app and then see your community as a part of it. So again, full featured apps, value packed apps, not access to the community. Lastly, I wanna talk about monetizing your outposts. And an outpost, that's a term that was coined by Chris Brogan, and I like it a lot. An outpost is basically a presence that you maintain on a third-party platform that you don't control. So Twitter, Facebook, uh, Tumblr, YouTube, um, et cetera, those are outposts. You maintain these presences. You're offering value in those spaces. You're giving value. But you don't control them. And at the end of the day, you, you do want people to come back to your community, to come back to your website. That's part of the reason you might be participating. That's not to say you're not, again, you're offering value, but it's to, it's to hopefully, uh, you know, ensure that people see your community. Now with 
app post monetization disclosure is, is very important because you can't change the way, for example, a tweet looks. A tweet is a tweet. It looks the same. You can't make this get clear that this tweet is an ad. And the FTC just recently released new guidelines on this. So, for example, with Twitter, if you have a sponsored tweet, you want to start that with either ad, colon, ad, colon, space, or you want to put the word sponsored somewhere in the tweet. It used to be that you could put the hashtag spawn for sponsored in there, and that would probably be okay. But now they've specifically said, no, that's not okay. People aren't clear on what that means. So those two methods at the start, sponsored somewhere um, in the tweet, those are examples of, of the proper way to disclose a sponsored Twitter message. Um, different platforms have different, uh, probably different standards. And whatever you use to monetize will tell you how to do it or force you to do it. But just know that the disclosure has to live with the work. Again, it can't be on a separate page. It can't be in your Twitter bio that some, speech, some tweets are sponsored. No one looks at that. No one cares. No one's going to know. So you have to include it in the tweet itself, for example, with Twitter. Now, to get started, you want to work with vendors. Here's a few. YouTube has its partner program. Uh, if you upload videos to YouTube, original content, it's not hard to get a, to become a part of that and have advertising served with your videos. My likes offers uh, sponsored tweets and sponsored messages for social platforms. Sponsored tweets, Adly both work with Twitter. Buy Salaz allows you to sell tweets uh, as well. To take it to the next level, I think, again, selling direct, but I think maybe the most powerful way to do it is as a, as a bonus onto other campaigns. So you might be talking to someone about doing something in your community, and then you could say, hey, you know what would be a good addition to that package, what would complement it well is a sponsored tweet or a sponsored post here. You know, something to complement it that you can then charge a little more for and offer a little more value, a little more inventory. Now, as I'm discussing these methods, no matter what it was, display advertising, affiliate, in-text, monetizing your outposts, mobile, classifieds, brand placement, whatever, you probably heard one and you might have said to yourself, that's, that's not something I would do. I would never. That won't work with my community. It won't work with my audience. And you're right. You know, it's not a question of all these methods being effective. There's nothing, there's nothing wrong with these methods. There's nothing unethical about these methods. They all work for different audiences. So it... As I said earlier, you know your audience, I don't know your audience. And you know or have a good idea as far as what will resonate with them. And the way that you get the most out of monetization is through experimentation. I mean, that's simply the bottom line. You have to test things, you have to try things, you have to push the envelope a little bit sometimes, try to find a good comfort zone. You have to, I, I know I agonize over adding different types of monetization, but sometimes you have to try something and be willing to take it down, you know, and, and say it didn't work because you'll never find that if you don't at least try it. Experimentation is the key. And I have been to the world of Coca-Cola in Atlanta, Georgia a few times. And if you've ever been there, uh, it's a really cool place. But the end of the experience is a tasting room. And you know, you're in this room and you're surrounded by, oh, 180 different Coke products. They have the Coca-Cola freestyle machines, which have 100 plus flavors. They have sodas from around the world that Coca-Cola sells. And you, you, know, you, you end up trying all of them, of course, but you inevitably end up mixing them together. And most of those don't taste very good. But uh, sometimes you, you stumble across something that you like. And I, I like uh, something I call the Mellow Coke, which is, I think it's one part Mellow Yellow to two parts Coke. And you might not like it, but I like it, and some of my audience will like it, I think. So, you know, it, it's really all about experimentation and finding out what works best. It's about trying the different methods. You know, for some people, one of these methods will work and will help them accomplish their goals. For others, it might be three or four. It will almost never be all of them. Um, it's about finding that balance and finding the methods that, are, that speak most to your audience. It's really about knowing your audience, respecting your audience, and using what works best for you. And with that said, I'd like to open it up to uh, any questions here. All right. Oh, sorry, gonna, okay. Yes. Um, thank you, Patrick. I That was quite a lot you covered there from display ads to affiliate links, in-text monetization, ad networks, sponsored brand placement, premium memberships, product sales, mobile advertising, and tailoring that, integrating it into your platform, into your website, into your outposts, um, just finding what works for you and your community. So thank you for that deep dive into monetization. Um, I think we do have a couple questions here, and I hope uh, some of you are thinking about more questions to ask. I think we've just got a couple right now, so we'd love to hear from you. 
um, specifically any advertising methods you've tried for your community that haven't worked. Um, if you want to maybe take another look at why, uh, please do submit those questions. So let's start with uh, let's start with Jacob's question here. He says he has 19 members at the moment. So he's wondering when would monetization be effective? Does the amount of membership matter? So what I like to tell people, and there, so there, oh, so I should start with, there, there is this commonly held belief that is a good belief. It, it makes sense and it's, uh, it's successful for many people that you shouldn't have anything on your community as far as ads are concerned until you have traffic um, that allow you to, you know, send a reasonable amount of traffic to those ads. Now, again, that's, so you generate the traffic, then you add the advertising later. You worry about the monetization later. And that's, again, not a bad thing. But what I've found from my years of, of playing with this stuff is that if you're gonna have ads and you wanna have ads, start with ads. And that they might not be real ads, right? They could just be ads for features on your community. It could just be like uh, just a simple ad program like Google AdSense. But just having that inventory in place, having some spaces dedicated to ads on your website, it lets people know that the expectation is there that you will do that. And what I've found is that people don't like change and they like change even less when it concerns new ads. So what I think the danger of not adding it to later is, is that people get used to a certain thing. They get used to a certain experience and they think ads aren't a part of the community. Is that fair? No, it's not fair. Does that mean you should never change? No, it doesn't mean that either. You have to change sometimes. You have to do things that will make some people unhappy. You have to try new things. But, and that applies to not just monetization, but design and features and everything really. But at the same time, if you can avoid some of that friction, I say do it. And I say to go ahead and get some ads on the site if you plan to add them later. As far as other methods of monetization, I mean, there's no hard and fast rule. I think when you are excited about it and you think you have the potential uh, membership that will be interested in that type of advertising, then you can give it a go. I mean, obviously, you probably don't want to launch a, a classified ad section with 19 members. Probably not. Uh, you probably don't have the traffic to support that. You probably don't want to launch a premium membership program unless yours is a premium from the start community. Uh, based on 19 members, you probably want to grow and get bigger and get more traffic. So some methods uh, you want to hold off on. But when it comes to display ads, I say go ahead, get something up. And other than that, play it by ear and, and do it when you're excited about it. All right. Very good. And to build off that, we have a question from Stacy here. She's got a 900 member community that serves um, the biotech industry. And she sends out a daily email to share information that she posts on the blog. She doesn't have a great deal of traffic in her opinion, but she does receive about 900 impressions per day. Do you have any recommendations for uh, ways that Stacy can make the most out of that user dynamic? So biotech, um, you know, I think that it depends. I mean, Technical, technical audiences, technology savvy audiences, of which they sound like they are, um, can respond in different, more sensitive ways than general, more mainstream audiences. Like I might not do the same thing on photoshopforums.com as I would do on karateforums.com. Different audiences, they like different things, they, they view the web differently. So you know your audience, so I, I definitely proceed with that in mind. Um, you know, biotech, it sounds like you have a niche audience, which uh, most online communities do. And if you're around that audience, you probably know some of the brands that they like. You know, maybe you work with some of the brands, maybe they're in the community. I mean, 900 impressions it, to, uh, to some isn't a lot, but it's definitely a monetizable amount of traffic. And you can do a lot of things with that. So I would definitely, um, you know, if you're interested in serving ads, I would join some ad networks. I would get started that way. If you want to just sell direct, I would I would look at it that way too. I would go up, reach out to companies that would advertise your audience. I don't know biotech, so I don't know who that would be, but you certainly know people who want to reach that audience. So I would kind of them and see if they'd want to participate in a new ad program. You know, start it off at a basic level, a cheap level, and see if you can get some value out of it, and then expand uh, from there. I mean, if this is a, a community of you know professionals in the audience, and you're offering information that helps them to do their job better. I mean, there might be an opportunity to do premium memberships also, just because um, you know when when it's a professional community and they're getting professional value that speaks to their income and their living, um, then I think those types of audiences are more 
flexible when it comes to paying for a community and supporting the existence of that community because it supports their existence as well. Certainly, some some different plat some different methods I probably wouldn't do. Like I don't know I don't know what classified advertising would look like for biotech. I, I, I don't know. I think there might be a li too much liability involved. I don't know, but. Um, yeah, I would start with that. If you want to go to display advertising, start with some ad networks, start doing some direct sales. And 900 impressions is nothing to uh, to sneeze at. I think that's that's a decent amount, certainly a monetizable amount. I'm not going to say it's going to be a full-time job income, but uh, at least to support the site, to support further investment in it, to support further investment of your time, um, I think you can definitely reach out to some advertisers. Sounds good. Sounds like Stacy can start making some money. <laughs> Um, which is what we're all here to learn about doing. And to that end, Patrick asks if you could talk, uh, speak to in-stream video ads, if you know much about that. It's so bad I had to ask myself questions. Gosh, dang. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. You, you, have a, you have a very nice first name. Um, so in-stream ads, I haven't, uh, are we talking about video in-stream? Um, video, yeah. Or, or in-stream like a, like a Twitter stream? Or I will assume video. So uh video stream ads you know i haven't done a ton with video i'll be honest but i know that the ecosystem exists there there's certainly plenty of uh, video ad networks that you can hook in with i do host a, a five day a week video show called soda tasting where i taste and review sodas and i started that six months ago uh yesterday actually turned six months old and like i said five days a week i've been pumping out uh you know it, to me it's a lot of fun i enjoy it that's why i started it because i'm passionate about it but I've also, you know, been using the YouTube partner program quite a bit with the advertising that's in stream video. And, you know, I'm not blown away by the amount of money I'm receiving. It's okay. I, I, then again, I'm not a, a huge channel. So I, I think that in stream advertising is, I think it's yet another option. I think if you have video content, uh, it's yet another option. I mean, I spoke about display, but if your community has a newsletter, certainly that's the same kind of thing, right? There's email. Uh, people who, who specialize in monetizing email newsletters, you can include affiliate offers and newsletters. I mean, that's another uh, piece of your inventory. If you have a, a massive um, mailing list, that's inventory. If you have a massive RSS subscription base, you can have ads in your RSS feed. If you have uh, you know, a massive YouTube following or you have videos that are watched by many people, that's inventory also. So you know, it's all inventory that you can monetize. The trick is finding the balance between what's too much and what's still a great user experience. But uh, I think if you have great video content, it uh, is worthwhile to consider putting some form of advertising with it or at least trying it. People will complain about in-stream ads sometimes, but you know, to produce this content, quality video content, even my simple show, it takes time out of my week to put that content aside, to plan it out, to shoot, to edit, to upload, to write the descriptions, to publish the content on YouTube and on my blog. So. Again, uh, that's just inventory to monetize. Look at it like other forms of inventory. You can do a lot of the same things. The same things I talked about with, um, you know, just kind of display advertising, having affiliate links, and doing these different things. That applies pretty equally to video uh, and in-stream advertising as well. Okay. Um, and on the subject of videos, Omar is wondering if there's a tool set or a platform you would recommend for selling or renting training videos that he has created. Huh. Um, I know some that exist. I think Learnable is in that category too that I mentioned earlier from SitePoint. I can't really recommend anyone because I haven't actually done it myself. So, I mean, I like SitePoint a lot, so you can take a look at Learnable if they will allow you to sell your educational videos. I know there's different platforms out there that allow it, certainly, um, but just not having the first-hand experience myself, I would not, uh, not want to recommend any myself. Uh, that said, that opens up the door to experiment to try different ones to see what works best for you and even look at the idea of facilitating your own platforms. I mean, if you have an audience yourself, if you have an audience, uh, built into your community, then maybe you don't need them. Maybe you can just do something that's hosted within your uh, website. Then again, I talked about like buy sell ads being a turnkey platform for people who want to sell display ads directly. And that can be to take a lot of the headache away. So again, I guess it depends on how much they take from you and if that is really uh, worth it. Okay. Um, so Alexander is also looking for a recommendation or just to see if you know of any good widgets that you can embed on a site um, that facilitates classified micro advertisements um, with 
and also integrates with PayPal. Um, so it sounds like the uh, um, Alexandra, did you say? Yes. Okay. Would uh, would like something? Uh, she wants to do the classified ad thing, but just wants to like embed it on her site. I think so. That's yeah. correct. Yeah. Um. Do I know one? You know, not really. I, and I almost would not recommend that in general. I, I really think that it'd be it's better served if it's a part of the platform. I don't know. Again, just speaking to maybe a heavy Ning audience here, so I don't know how that fits in with Ning. If Ning has some options, or maybe that's a feature request for Ning uh, that someone could make and just have some sort of PayPal integration for. Uh, threats and to make it easier for people to approve new threats. No pressure on anyone, no pressure on us. <laughs> just, just mentioning that. And uh, if not, then maybe you want to look at some form of software, classified software that exists. I mean, I tend to recommend people make it as part of their platform at the start, whatever they're doing. You can probably create a section, create a form, create a category, and then get an add on of some kind and charge for threads or have threads be by approval only and then approve them once the payment's received and vice versa. Um, but yeah, I, I don't really have an embeddable uh, widget recommendation, unfortunately, I would have to say. Yes, and um, you, can, you could set that up on Ning using the classifieds add-on. Laura also mentions that Project Wonderful does that, so that's something to look up, Project Wonderful. Okay, yeah, I'm, I've, I've heard the name. <laughs> and let's see. Um, so it appears that that may be about it with the questions. Um, Laura was wondering if you could address SEO, the tagging threads and content that brings folks back to the site as a way to increase page views, traffic, and potentially advertising income as well. I will plead the fifth. No, uh, you know, SEO is not really an area that I spend a lot of time on just because uh, being primarily a woman operation, you have to choose where you spend your time. My SEO consists of having good page titles, having good um, URLs, good post slugs, as some might call them, having good content and making sure search engines can index it. And I think for a lot of people, that's uh, you know that's a good way to go. Tagging, I mean, I'm tagging stuff all the time with Soda Tasting now, so I'm getting a little more into that. Um, I mean, that's just creating a different category for search engines to index. It's, it's categorization within categorization. So. It's kind of those smaller micro level categories. And if you can group your content in a way that meets with people, what people are searching with, I think that's a good thing. Um, I don't really have any specific advice beyond that. I'm definitely not heavy into SEO and just try to stick to the basic good core principles, create good stuff, make sure it's titled well, make sure it's categorized well, and then make sure they can index it. And if you do that, um, I tend to believe that paired with you know good management of the community, you're putting yourself in most likely the best chance uh, the best chances of having success. Sounds like uh, good advice. I think I've heard something along the lines of, you know, keeping it to two to five percent keyword density um, is also <laughs> yeah. helpful. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't I, you're, you, you'd know as much as I would about mm -hmm. that stuff. You know, I, I almost think. I am not, not anti SEO or any of that stuff, but I almost think that sometimes people spend too much time worrying about that stuff. Um, you know, not to say I don't think about how I title my posts, right? Not to say I don't use Google keyword tool once in a while and, and, and that I think data is bad. I think it's good to look at data. I just worry when we try to write things in a certain way that isn't human, that isn't the way we'd speak, and we try to match it with keywords. I, I don't know. I think, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm just too, um, maybe I'm just being too much of a, uh, I don't know, emotional person. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, no, I think that makes sense. I think that's more and more, you know, with the release of Penguin and new search algorithms, uh, unnatural or robotic keyword stuffing is definitely getting penalized. So just keeping it real um, is the way to go. Um, well, thank you again, Patrick. This has been really informative. And I'd encourage everyone to go check out monetizing online forums as well as to develop a media pack for your community. If you haven't already created one, uh, creating one, keeping it up to date, it's, you know, it's definitely sounds like a good resource to have on hand and something that advertisers would look for. Um, so that's really good advice. And I can't wait to check out your soda tasting, try some mellow Coke. <laughs> it's easy. It's, it's, it's very easy. Head to your local grocery store, buy two sodas, mix them together, bam. <laughs> Delicious. <laughs>
All right. Well, thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, I'll have a recording available and send it to you in a follow-up email. Really appreciate your time and hope you learned a little something. Thank you.